Okay, so uh, this will be now the second talk in the mini course about um, the uh, applications of combinatorial topology and distributed computing. So it's uh, always nice to give a talk in Bonn, and uh, there's a lot of things going on in Bonn. Now, th there's so many things going on, you notice probably there is a calendar of events, and this is not just ours, but there's uh, like a whole string of events. So the audience you get depends on what events are run in parallel with yours. So I, I'm very lucky because uh, at the same time as I'm giving my two talks, Gert Faltings is giving the talk in Max Planck Institute. <laughs> so, so I guess um, those of you who know Gert Faltings is you appreciate this. Okay. All right. So, um, so Morris has already very nicely made an introduction to uh, distributed computing. Now, he also mentioned that it's distributed computing and combinatorial topology. So I thought I'll say a few words about combinatorial topology part before going to the... Um, so should I do this? Oh. Right, he mentioned that the battery was low. Okay. Let's see, so maybe there is a way to change here directly. Mm -hmm. ah. Okay, so <laughs> it will be like a one slide talk. <laughs> yeah, it's so, uh, oh, what did I press? Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay, well, let me just, maybe. maybe. <laughs> All right, so this will be two slide talks. So, um, <laughs> so combinatorial algebraic topology. So, um, so of course you, you're very familiar with algebraic topology. Now in combinatorial algebraic topology, um, one also wants to compute the uh, invariance, but uh, we want to compute the combinatorial invariance, the, 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 the algebraic invariance for uh, what we call combinatorial cell complexes. And usually the ways we compute them uh, um, is uh, are combinatorial. So, uh, Okay, this goes back. Okay, this goes forward. Right. So uh, actually in the previous talks, you have seen it multiple times, uh, things appearing um, of the commentary topology, for example, yesterday by uh, Professor Levy, there were uh, flag uh, complexes, which is uh, one of the well-known constructions <coughs> in the combinatorial topology, where you start with some discrete objects, in, in your case, d the directed graphs, and then there, are, there is a multitude of ways to construct um, Simplicial complexes out of them. So, a particular flag complex would be such a construction. Um, so, a let's see. So, at least this thing works. Yeah, this works. Okay. So, of course, um, also in the talks about the concurrency, there were a lot of prod simplicial and even um, now I've forgotten what exactly the name was. Prod something else. Uh, prod. Hmm? Pro, prod permutahedron. Okay, I'll train prod permutahedron uh, <laughs> complexes. So this is all uh, examples of such a situation where you have some sort of um, combinatorial family, in this particular case, pro direct products of permutahedra, apparently, and you construct in combinatorial ways these complexes, and you want to understand things about them. And the complexity is obviously not on the local level because the cells you're gluing together are very simple, but on the global level uh, because uh, they are indexed by some combinatorial objects, or maybe a little bit more, and combinatorial objects. In the case of concurrency, uh, there, is, uh, there, are, there is other information <coughs> which they're encoding, but then the ultimate goal is to have a complete description of uh, these cells which you glue together in a language of combinatorics, graphs, partitions, or whatever it takes. And then also the operation of taking boundary should be described in the same language, so that then you basically just computing uh, combinator algebraic invariance for chain complexes, just uh, skipping topology completely, but it doesn't make it much simpler because there the, the, the difficulties which arise then of combinatorial nature. So, um, like I mentioned in the talks today, uh, in the talks this week, there were several examples of this, but also other places. <laughs> for example, if you took, um, there is a classical uh, problem of um, of so-called chromatic number of a graph. So you, you have a graph and you ask yourself how many colors do you need to color the vertices so that minimal number so that any two vertices which are connected by an edge have different colors. So that's, that's uh, NP complete. It's a very hard problem already for very small samples. 
uh, but this is one example where topology can help. Um, so algebraic invariants such as Stiefelwitni characteristic classes and other invariants can help to get lower bounds for chromatic number. But before this, you would have to go through a certain machinery of constructing such combinatorial complexes, which would be, in this case, complexes put together out of all maps between graphs, and then you would have to have abstractions to existence of certain maps in this situation. Okay, and so what, um, so in particular, I, I had a book some years ago about this uh, set of topics, which was actually fittingly called combinatorial algebraic topology, and probably the same here, I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, I, I really, I, I don't actually know what it says, but anyway, so, and, and this is kind of thing which is maybe the second, the yin and yang, the second part of what, um, of what Morris was talking about, namely the combinatorial topology. Okay, so I already mentioned that there was this, uh, so, so the idea is to look for abstractions, and uh, in Morris' talk we have seen also such a, uh, such a situation uh, which arose in distributed computing, where people looked for abstractions in, um, for the consensus task in, in, in this, um, what's called Sperner Lemma and other things like that. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about was uh, that I wanted to make, uh, well, hopefully not too technical, but a little bit more technical than Morris' talk, uh, a walk through um, different uh, families of uh, simplicial complexes which arise in the distributed context in the first part and see how they depend on the model which you use. And in the second part, I wanted to go in one specific direction and to, to get down to some open questions, and hopefully uh, and then be able to formulate um, open questions in purely uh, simplicial uh, combinatorial language without any mention of distributed computing. I mean, they're motivated by distributed computing, but in the end, the question is just a question about simplicial complexes. Okay, so, um, so uh, hopefully not doubling, but echoing the, the talk by Morris. He went through this in, in a little different notations. Uh, when we have a distributed computing question where you have several processes which interact in some way, um, there, there is a multitude of simplicial uh, structures which you can impose. So the first and the simplest one um, is a simplicial complex of initial configurations, a so-called input complex. So if you just have n, 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 n processes and they have certain values which they can take, um, you could just encode um, any set of initial values which is allowed by simplex. So you will have a simplicial complex like that. And uh, so this is part of what in distributed computing is called task specification. So the set of allowed inputs is part of the task specification. So, for example, in the questions of consensus, where you just have n processes, and each process, say, binary consensus, you have n processes, and each one can take value 0 or 1. This will be, and uh, you allow any, you have no restrictions, then you'll just have uh, some simplicial sphere um, as an input complex. So, um, as the other important part of the, the second important part of the distributed task, um, is uh, the set of final configurations, allowed final configurations. <coughs> so, you, for example, you, like in the consensus question, you have your supposed your algorithm executes, and in the end, there is a set of allowed final outputs. Okay. So, if you're looking for a complete consensus, very rigid, you just ask everybody decides zero, everybody decides one. That's going to be a, a, this output complex will just consist of two simplices. Okay. But you could, you could imagine more, uh, more interesting um, restrictions on what the output should be. For example, you could say we start with 100 processes, I think Morris mentioned it, and, and um, we want them in the end not to agree on, on one value, but the total set of values which they choose should be at most 99. Okay? So if you, uh, if you ask for 100, then it's easy because each one chooses his own value. You have 100 processes, each has its own value. But if you ask, I want them just 90, it, it, to, if I take all of the values they've chosen, it's more than one, but not more than 99. So it actually turned out that even such a task is unsolvable. And if you looked at the output complex, it would be more interesting because you're looking at a, at a skeleton of a simplex instead or some questions like that. <coughs> 
Okay, so these are the simple uh, situations. You have the input complex, you have the output complex. Okay. Now, and this, uh, this depends only on, on the task. Okay. Now, when you have the algorithm which runs, so-called protocol, distributed protocol, then the idea is, and, and this is what Morris also mentioned, is that uh, you have many possible executions. Okay. So instead of a uh, consequent uh, pro uh, algorithm, you have many, many possible executions. And, um, well, they occur, the things occur in certain order. So for example, if you have, let's say, two processes and each one uh, plans to read and then to write, then there are different combinations in which this can occur in time. And your computational model will I impose certain restrictions, what you allow, what you don't allow. In the most general case, you allow everything. You'll just, the so-called read-write model, you'll just say, they can do it in any order, it doesn't matter. In the more restricted setting, you will have uh, restrictions. They will be more artificial from the distributed computing point of view. However, as Morris pointed out in his talk, the topological models will become simpler. And if at the same time you know that computationally these models are equivalent, you may want to look at the one which is more artificial from the distributed computing point of view, but which you can actually understand topologically, and then make the conclusions. All right. So, uh, and the idea is that if, you have, if I have such a protocol, such an algorithm, I will encode the set of all of its computations as a simplicial complex. This is so-called protocol complex. So this just means that for every execution, I will have a simplex. And, um, and then I'll have the views. So, um, so actually, maybe I should have a little example. connected to what I said. So, uh, aha. Okay, so, uh, so you have seen this picture. In Morris talk, and that's a protocol complex. And that encodes <coughs> the following situation. So you have um, two processes. Okay, and each one does a very simple, uh, so we're looking at the model where they have a memory, shared memory. And each process has operations read and write. Okay, and um, each process has a protocol um, for itself. And it says, first I read, and then I, I, I write. First I read what's in the memory, and then I write my value into the memory. So that's a very simple, um, very simple protocol. And then the question is, what executions can we have? And the answer is, we can have three possible executions. Okay, so either uh, the execution is that the first guy reads, and then he writes, and then the second guy <coughs> reads, and then he writes. So that would encode R0, W0, R1, W1. Or the other way around. Or the, uh, the first guys, they both read and then they write. Okay. These are all possibilities. If um, the R's and the W's commute because um, the reading does not interact with other guys reading. However, uh, the reading and writing will, will interact, right? So in this case, for example, the, for the zeros guy, he will not actually see the value. Of the, uh, of the first guy. Okay, so this is three executions. One, two, three. And they encode it as uh, three uh, simplices. Okay. And, <coughs> and then, what are the vertices? So this is uh, the, 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 po the whole point of distributed computing is uncertainty. We don't know what execution we have. This is the problem. What we know is what processes see. Okay, so we have what processes see. Now the problem is if I take one guy, from his view there could be executions which are indis indistinguishable. Okay, so for example, if I take let's say the first and the, and the last one, then the view of uh, process number one 
will be the same in both. Namely, he will see the value of the other guy. Of course, he will also see his own value. But he also sees it. So to him, he does not know what execution. So, the if, so there was a god, I, there was a picture, I think it was god with fingers like that. So he knows, but uh, the guys don't know. So this is the whole point of distributed computing, right? So you have these actors reacting, and then they see something, they don't know what's going on, they only see partial information, and they want to make conclusions. We need to model that. Okay, so here we have three possibilities. And uh, the idea is that you put a vertex, so an edge here is an execution. Okay, it will have the dimension which will be number of processes minus one. And here the vertices are views of the of the of the uh, of the, pro uh, the of the processes. So, for example, there is a vertex between these two edges, which is the view of, let's say, the first process, and this has executions one and three, and it doesn't distinguish between them. Sometimes you can actually see from the view what the execution is, right? So, for example, from this one, you can actually <coughs> see that. Um, what the execution is, because if this guy, uh, the zeroes guy, only sees himself, he actually knows what the execution is. Okay. So this is the basic, uh, the basic model. You have here two processes, and they each execute once, and this has a possible interleavings. That's a picture. And um, now what we'll do is that we increase the number of processes, we increase the complexity of protocols, and we also look at different computational models, depending on what uh, do we allow for interleavings in the execution. Okay, but, but this is the gist of the thing. So there is no edge between here and here. There is no execution where no process sees the other process. <coughs> in each execution, somebody sees somebody. Okay. All right, so this is, uh, this is the, the, the general idea. And so this is this, uh, protocol complexes. So they depend on the protocols. Okay. Now the task itself, for example, if it's consensus or something else, weak symmetry breaking or whatever, should be specified somehow. And it's specified that f um, as a way to specify it in, in distributed computing is that for any set of inputs, you say what is the set of allowed outputs. Okay. In the simplicial language, it means that for every simplex in the input complex, we have to associate, well, not a simplex, but a subcomplex of the output complex, right? So it's not a, what we call simplicial map. It's, a, it's what we call in the book carrier map. So it's a, it takes simplices to subcomplexes, and um, depending on the conditions, usually one imposes additional conditions on these carrier maps. Okay. So you can already see from the first few th uh, things that these complexes will not be just some general uh, simplicial complexes. They will come with a lot of structure as much as, as you <laughs> put to it. But, for example, the first thing is that they are all uh, colored, okay? Because uh, um, by nature, what we are trying to encode are compatible um, inputs, compatible outputs, or compatible views on the execution in the protocol complex. I will have a color, which means, uh, which is in the name of the process. Okay, so this is not always the case, of course. If you have simply show complexes, we cannot just put colors usually. So, but here, <coughs> they will come automatically with a coloring. Okay, so in particular, think like bodycentric subdivision in this in this model will not be allowed because if you have a triangle, it's colored. You put this um, uh, vertex in the middle, you need the force color, but you don't have that, so this will not happen. Okay. Then, so then there is a task specification map, which is a carrier map. Then there is another uh, part of the structure, uh, also a carrier map from input complex to the protocol complex, so-called execution map. So that map takes all possible, uh, each input to the set of all possible executions given that input. Okay. So of course, the uh, protocol complex itself will consist of such images of this execution maps because it's composed of all possible inputs. But in fact, you will see that is there are interesting tasks where, where you even only have like one input. You only have one. There is no, 
variety of inputs. You only have one input, but you have to solve the distributed computing problem. Okay, and then there is actually a simplicial map from the protocol complex to the output complex. Okay, so that's a map which takes executions to outputs. So that's a decision map. Okay, so these are parts of the structure. I think Morris had this nice triangle diagram from, from, our, from our book, but um, I like, you can also think about it in, in this, um, in this uh, language, but uh, yeah, so you have, you have inputs, outputs, and executions, and these are the maps, but um, right, so you have, <coughs> right, and then the task specification. And then um, you can formulate in this language what it means for a distributed protocol to solve a distributed task. So it will just say that this diagram commutes under conditions which are further technical conditions which are imposed. It's not a diagram of simplicial maps. Two of these maps are carrier maps. So the commutativity will mean inclusion, but it, you can rigorously write it down and you can define the notion of distributed task or um, also the distributed uh, uh, protocol in purely simplicial complex uh, terms. So similar to what Professor Levy was talking yesterday about their model with, uh, with a categorical model, it's the same here. So you make some model, you take in some structure which you hope uh, you don't, f but maybe there is more structure which you didn't take along, but you take the coloring, the maps should respect that and all that. This is all natural restrictions which are imposed by the distributed computing and the results will depend on these additional uh, conditions. And otherwise you just have some general situation, there's nothing true in it. Okay, so I don't really want to go through the list of technical conditions which you need to impose, but this is a rough roadmap how you can go from distributed to purely simplicial picture of simplicial complexes, simplicial maps, and also carrier maps. And the diagrams, which uh, pictures, which uh, which Morris had, were from the consensus task. This triangles. Okay. So um, I wanted to go through three, uh, mention three <coughs> different models of computation. Uh, first one I want to talk more detail than the others because that's also the one which is mostly used. But they all have these long names because of the uh, you start with the model and then you impose conditions. And like I said. <coughs> The, the, more the, the more conditions you impose, the less natural the model becomes, uh, the easier it is topologically. So the simplest one actually is what's called uh, layered immediate snapshot protocol complexes. Is that correct terminology? Is it? Okay. Because some people say something else for layered. Okay, so let me just quickly uh, go through this because Morris already mentioned this. So in this model, this is a standard model, Processes communicate uh, through shared memory using operations write and snapshot read, okay, which means they read the whole memory at once with heal out crash failures, and the protocols are synchronous and weight free. Um, weight free is a concept which was actually introduced in distributed computing uh, by, by 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 you, I think. No, yeah, so by him. <laughs> okay, uh, meaning that there is no upper bound on how long this um, it takes to execute the step. So that's actually a very nice concept from the simplicial point of view. Anyway, so, um, and so all executions are immediate snapshot, um, which means that um, in each uh, execution, they uh, come become active in, pair, in groups, uh, and then they all read and then they all write. Also, we'll see in a second a, a situation where this is not the case, but this is for now, like in all of these cases, you see for two process, actually nothing else can happen. So, so, so both, so for example, here it's first the zero activates and the first one, here it's first the first one and the zero, and here they, they both activate at the same time. So that's a simplified situation. There could be more complicated interleavings. And furthermore, one more step is that we assume that all the executions are what's called layered, which means that they come in rounds, which sounds like it makes it synch uh, synchronous, but it's actually still asynchronous. Um, but you can formulate it differently, but anyway. So this means that they all are activated in groups, and in each round you also want that each one is activated exactly once. Okay. So this gets you to this picture. So um, if you say, this is my model, like, we s like I was mentioning very briefly uh, in the introduction, whatever you say, whatever you say, you, you can make any conditions, through this simplicial machinery, in the end, we will have 
a model for this. <coughs> and this is uh, the most used one, which we we'll talk about now. And what do you get out in the end? In the end, what you get is a subdivision of a simplex. Okay, so the protocol complex will be just a subdivision of a simplex, what uh, we now call standard chromatic subdivision. So that's actually a nice construction, which is also otherwise quite useful. It's uh, the, the colored analog of the barycentric subdivision. Okay. So like I said, if you have colors on the vertex, from the mathematical point of view, so if you have colors on the vertex, on the on, on, on simplicial complex, barycentric subdivision is prohibited. Okay. It is prohibited already for an edge. If I have two colors, black and white, I'm not allowed to put a vertex in the middle without increasing number of colors. But I'm allowed to put in two, and two is also the minimal number, right? So then the coloring will be black, white, black, white, okay? And if I want to do it in all dimensions, the right thing to do is this. So this is what's called standard chromatic subdivision. So you put in three vertices here in the middle, and then you put two on the edges, and this can be generalized to all dimensions. How this works? So, um, what, 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 is, what does this triangle mean? So we have looked at this uh, edge. So what does this triangle mean? So this triangle means the following. So this triangle means that we have three processes here called 0, 1, and 2. And they execute the, the same protocol as in this case for the two processes. So their, pro pro their protocol is very simple. Each one just reads and writes once. So it turns out that uh, for three, then there, uh, here we had three executions, here we will have 13 executions. And these executions are very easy to describe combinatorially. So most of, so most of what I'll be talking about when you produce this uh, simplicial complexes is inventing combinatorial language to describe simplicial complexes, executions, and so on. And in each model, it's a different language, and uh, the more you make, it gets increasingly complex. So in the simplest case, of this very long name <coughs> computational model, but some people simply call it the standard model, that maybe is more appropriate. Um, the uh, executions will simply be um, ordered partitions. So, um, for example, in this case here, I would simply encode this by zero, so actually, I would simply encode this by zero, one, here, one, zero, and here it's a zero, one, just one piece. So this is the order partitions for two. And if you uh, take a zero, one, and two, then there will be 13 ordered partitions. Okay. So there will be very special ordered partition, which everybody's together in one block, one, two, three. It corresponds to the execution where they all go simultaneous. That's the one we see in the middle here. That's uh, the uh, corresponding to just everybody goes simultaneous. Okay, and the others correspond to different others. So for example, of course, there will be also execution which they go one after the other. So these are just uh, permutations, right? So there should be six of them. And these pictures, they correspond to this triangle. So this is one, this is one, this, this, and this. These are six triangles. But all of the triangles, so you could also approach it from a different point of view. If I came from, um, or, if, if I started from where I usually come from, which is combinatorial topology, I wouldn't even bother about the distributed context. I would simply say we make a simplicial complex out of ordered partitions. Okay, so my, my simplest is ordered partitions. And now I have to tell you how to glue them together. Now that's a complicated part, but uh, I can do this. Um, right, I have to say what the vertices are and I have to say what the edges are. Okay, so the vertices like we learned, are views of the, of the processes. So here, if they execute once, what can one process see? So this is, this complexes encode knowledge, okay? So the knowledge it encodes in this case is what does this process see? So if you just run it once, and you have n processes, all that the process sees is that he goes there, he reads what's there, all he can read is who was there before. He just reads their inputs, okay? So it's just a set, okay? So these are the vertices. So the vertices will be on simply all subsets of the set 0, 1, 2 with a distinguished element, which is the guy who is doing the reading, okay? And there is a number of them. So each one can see four different things because each guy sees himself. So then there are only four possibilities what else he can see. Okay, so there will be 12 vertices. Now the edges are a little bit more complicated because what are the edges? The edges are p 
pairs of compatible views. Okay, so the pairs of compatible views. So the edge. So in other words, if I have two guys, they have seen something, I can ask, is there at all an execution under which that's what they see? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. In this model, there is always either um, no such execution or one or two. Okay, because in this particular case, this is a manifold, and um, so each edge is adjacent to two triangles. But that's, that's, uh, that's a very simple geometric property, but it actually is a non-trivial statement in distributed computing, and it says something about the model. It's not true in all the models, but in this model it is true. In this model it is true that if I have the views of all the process but one, then there are two possibilities, or one. Okay, okay so then you have to produce some combinatorial language to describe them, and as a next step, of course, you can imagine that it becomes more complicated because I, of course, do not write such simple protocols where they just execute it once. In the very least, I want them to execute a few times. Okay? I mean, but the, the way we approach it is that we try to make um, uh, 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 um, models which we can analyze and then to increase them until the limit, until we cannot anymore analyze them. Okay. So, so here it, you will just repeat the uh, process of uh, subdivision, of the chromatic subdivision. It is an operation on colored simplicial complexes which can be iterated, okay? Just like barycentric subdivision, so it's the same. You can just iterate this. So uh, let me just maybe uh, say very quickly why, uh, w uh, a very simple way to see why these guys are actually um, subdivisions of a simplex, it's actually a non, uh, a not s simple task, at least to me, to, to prove that something is a subdivision of, of a simplex, okay? It's much easier to prove that something is, is homotopy equivalent to the something else, or to, or it's contractible, or compute its homology groups, or stiefel witney classes, whatever you want, because this is a big develop. But if you say this is really a subdivision, you have just combinatorial description of the complex. This can be, yeah. So it's very easy to check different things. Like pseudo manifold, for example, is very easy to check because it's just it's a combinatorial condition. But subdivision is not is not. But here you can actually see it very easily because uh, if you look at this picture of this um, edge with two vertex in this edge, of course the first thing you see is a square, right? This is a square. This is the first thing you see. Right, because if you have a, uh, a square, and you approach it from the side, and look inside, then that's what you see. Okay, so that's what's called Schlegel diagram of the square. And it turns out that these guys are basically Schlegel diagrams. Now, it's obvious, if you, sh so you have a polytop, a, a convex polytop, if you approach from a side and look inside, you will for sure see a subdivision of this face which you are looking through, right? Because it's just a linear view on the inside. So that's immediate, you don't have to prove anything. So Schlegel diagram is by construction a subdivision, and that's basically what happens here. So you can, if you look at this picture, uh, right, uh, let's see. In this picture here, this is a, an iteration of Schlegel diagram. So the, uh, let's see. So the first step, you look inside and you see this. This is the next uh, analog of the square in dimension three. That's what you see because, well, there are different ways, but um, we're looking not the cubes, but the, the dual ones. So this is dual. And then uh, you add the edges and so on. Okay. So it actually turns out that you can uh, collapse this. So, so you can prove like this that they are subdivisions of the of the uh, simplices, they're collapsible. Then people, uh, Eric Goubeau and, and collaborators in Paris have proved that also the the, if you iterate it several times, it is still collapsible, which is not the same statement as being um, subdivision. It's obvious that it's a subdivision, because once you have a subdivision once, you iterate it, it will be subdivision, but they are non-collapsible subdivision of simplices. So it's a, it's a, from the topological point of view, it's a non-trivial result. Um, and so if you iterate it, um, they proved it. And there are different uh, properties of this. The, the question is, of course, what is, uh, what is interesting, uh, what is not? So um, you see, 
these things are inspired by distributed computing, and some of the properties of them are extremely important, and they solve immediately some distributed computing questions. Some other properties are more of interest from the mathematical point of view. But still, we do it together because you never know. And then uh, in the end, you need these properties which at the face of it didn't have a direct analog in the distributed computing. In the end, you used it to actually prove something in distributed computing. So uh, we don't distinguish. But in particular here, actually, the actual fact that it's a subdivision of a simplex um, is not as important as the fact that it's a pseudo-manifold. That, for distributed computing, for example, is a much more important fact and also much simpler to prove. Because, like I say, this is just a combinatorial verification rather than geometric yoga. But this is kind of things which are... Okay. Okay, now the situation um, called snapshot protocol complexes. Um, so this are a... Okay, so let, so, so let me just um, talk about this for a while. So, so in this model which we looked at, which was a very nice picture, subdivisions of the simplices, we had always assumed quite artificial thing. We assumed that the executions come in groups, and moreover, that they come in this total rounds, okay? And by the end, each one. So this is kind of a funny assumption. What would, be, what would happen if we assume nothing? Okay, so the read-write model, which means you just have guys, they read and write. That's actually, from the distributed computing point of view, the most natural thing to look at, okay? Just don't, don't assume anything. So it turns out that computationally it's equivalent, actually, but uh, topologically it's quite complicated. So uh, I, I think due to the time, I will not go in detail through the combinatorial description of the cells. So all of these descriptions are generalizations of uh, this uh, picture where we had the uh, ordered partitions, but now we have to be more complicated, right? Because the strings can be quite convoluted, right? So the, uh, the picture, so the first one, so let's, okay, so let's look what happens if you just have uh, one round execution. So if you have just one round of execution, then for two processes, nothing more happens because nothing more can happen. However, for three things can happen. So for three, for example, you have an execution which uh, which is this R1 R2 W1 R0 W0 and W2 okay so that's so what let's look at this execution so this execution says the first guy reads and the second guy reads uh, number one reads number two reads or let's make in each order then the first one um, number one writes and then the zeros reads. Okay, so in the previous model, this is not allowed because this guy jumped out of line. These guys are not finished yet in the old model. But in this model, it's, we want to be more realistic, we allow this. Why should he wait until they are done? Well, he jumps in and reads also. Okay. After which there is no, uh, since the protocol is the old do it once, there is no other way than they both write and then they finish. Okay, so that's a new execution string which geometrically means that in our old picture we have more. We have additional, a, um, we have additional <coughs> triangles glued on. So here, for example, there is one triangle. So there will be a number of them. There will be six of them. They correspond to such. There will be six exceptional executions for three processes doing just one round. Okay. So then it's immediately more complicated because this is not anymore a subdivision. This is not anymore a pseudo-manifold. What can we say about it? Well, actually not much. I mean, we can say that this is, uh, well, we can prove that it is collapsible. So there is a theorem that it's collapsible for any set of processes, for any number of processes. But, you know, if you start to look at local structure, it can be quite complicated. Okay. So, uh, again, I probably will not go through the proof, but there is a combinatorial proof to prove it's collapsible. Um, but I want to mention that um, there is a also a, a continuation of this work, a theorem by, by Fernando Benevides and Sergio Reisbaum, um, who proved um, that even if you go multiple rounds, so my, my theorem is just one round, just one round. It's a complicated, so I call them view complexes. So it's just a family of simplicial complexes indexed by number n, so called view complexes. And this is one round. And, but you can also ask for more than one round, multiple round, and they become very quickly quite complicated. Even for two processes, you will get graphs. So actually, these are not labels, but it's a number of edges in between. I just don't have space to draw these graphs. 
you can see at least that they all will be trees, but they will be quite quickly quite complicated. Okay, so this is, say, if you have two processes and <coughs> each one executes three times, you will get some big tree. Okay, so they proved that they're still collapsible in all situations. So that's quite uh, complicated, uh, uh, more, more sophisticated um, thing. But, um, Actually, I'm curious what it means for distributed computing, but from the topological point of view, it's a quite nice result to have. So you have this family of complexes, and they're all um, collapsible, even though they're still quite complicated. So there are more things to be understood about them. And now to, to, to finish, uh, the third family is uh, hybrid. Um, actually, maybe I just uh, skip the, I just go to the picture. So you could also combine the two things which I was talking about. So in the first model, we had two conditions, which is that they all execute by being activated in groups, and in each round, each one should execute at least once. And in the second model, we have no conditions at all. Now, you could also have a middle model, which, um, in which you still ask them to come in groups. So the execution goes like this. You have the same processes, and then you choose a group, they execute, which means uh, together they read, and then they write another group, and so on. But you do not have the round condition. Okay? So in particular, if you have uh, three processes, you allow to say 1 and 2 active, now 0 and 1 active, and now again 0 active, and things like that. You don't have to go in partitions. So this will be just sequences of blocks. And this is an interesting model, which is in between these two models. And um, accordingly, topology is also in between. Okay? So for the first model, we know very well what happens. We have a subdivision of a simplex, and we know I mean, according to me, at least pretty much everything there is to know about the model itself. There are still questions about some labelings of vertices, which we'll look after lunch, at, which are complicated questions. But just for the model, there's nothing, at least I don't know what more there is to know. It's completely clear the situation. For the second one we talked about, is, is okay, you know that they are collapsible, but there are a lot of things which are collapsible, you know, and there, otherwise there is no structure at all. And here it's interesting because actually, uh, conjecturally, there are also subdivisions, but um, I don't think this is uh, proof that there are subdivisions, but I'm completely sure. So it's, it's, I succeeded to prove very close to that there are subdivisions. I can prove that they are homeomorphic. Like I said, subdivision itself is kind of a pain, but I proved that it's homeomorphic and the homeomorphism to the simplex preserves cells and things like that. But just subdivision itself, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, okay. But it's conjecturally, at least, that they are. Um, uh, subdivisions, but uh, probably that they are what we call simplicially homeomorphic. It's a stri slightly stronger than just homeomorphic to a, to a, to a ball, simplicially homeomorphic to a simplex. Okay, I think I'm five minutes over time, and I think it's a good. Uh, I stop here, maybe. Yeah.